Uh, we can think of neural networks as being a very new topic. In fact, it isn't. It's a fairly old one. In fact, uh, the first uh, neural network research goes back to the end of the 19th century. And uh, there are several examples of this work. Uh, and there were the first Nobel Prizes in this area, uh, which were given to an Italian, Golgi, and to a Spanish person, Ramon y Cajal. It was one Nobel Prize given in uh, physiology uh, and medicine to two individuals for complementary work on uh, neural networks. The uh, Spanish man uh, had done a lot of work on the individual neuron. The Italian, uh, Golgi, who was a professor at the University of Pavia, uh, Ramon y Cajal was in Madrid, uh, the Italian had looked at the network structure for the first time. He was looking at, he had discovered techniques to color natural uh, brain tissue so that you could see under the microscope the details of the neural networks, underlying networks. So there was, was a very interesting complementary type piece of work. So there was this work, but there was also work in Paris by a man called Lapique. And today we still use Lapique's equation uh, concerning neural networks. And his study was uh, related to physiology, but it was also related to external observations. And he had uh, discovered, he's the first person to indicate that in fact, uh, the internal functioning of a neuron uh, and the internal functioning of neurons between each other, the communication, is based on spikes. Spikes means that these are very short signals with a high rise in electrical potential and a fall. Uh, so whatever happens up here in our brains is based on spikes going between neurons. So, and this all goes back over 100 years, 120 years. So this is extremely interesting because for a long time this field remained quiescent. I mean, there was a lot of work going on, but there was limited interest until uh, the 1940s. And in the 1940s, we have the work of McCulloch and Pitts. Uh, these two people uh, offered a simplified model of how a network of neurons might work. And the simplification was such that they had removed the idea of the spikes, of the presence of spikes, and they had a representation which was essentially deterministic, that is non-random, and it was based on analog behavior of circuits. If you look at a book from 1940, the 1940s, late 1940s, called Automata Studies, published by the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, you will see the paper of McCulloch and Pitts, and you will see also another very interesting paper by someone called Kleene. Kleene was, if you wish, at the foundation of the mathematics of programming languages. Uh, he developed something called regular expressions. However, his motivation, if you look at the title of the paper, his motivation was he was thinking that he was developing a calculus for the representation of communication in nerve nets. This is what he said he was doing. In fact, what he ended up doing historically was a calculus for representing languages, mathematical languages. The spiking activity of the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, with the network activity of uh, Golgi, uh, Ramon e Cajal for the, the detailed study of the single cell, and this work 50 years later approximately, uh, done by McCulloch and Pitts, uh, these were the foundations, and Kleene, these are the foundations of what we call the field of neural networks. In the field of neural networks, there is another very important aspect, and you always wonder why we can use them for something useful, because we see that there are lots of interesting applications. The basis of that is, again, two mathematical theorems, so they are theorems. It, it was shown um, in the early 80s and late 80s that neural networks can be used as uh, approximators for continuous and bounded functions. Uh, continuous, 
we have an intuitive sense of what it means, uh, although it's a mathematical term. And bounded, bounded means that if you have a finite input, the output will remain finite. Okay, so you're talking about continuous and bounded functions, and neural networks have been proved to approximate continuous and bounded functions. And there are two pieces of work. One of them is mine uh, from the uh, late uh, 80s, showing that random neural networks are approximators of continuous and bounded functions. So those are the basis for why we can actually use them so commonly. And then, if you look at a lot of the research that has been going on for the last 10 years, which has brought back neural networks into fashion, and which have, has made them practical, uh, what you see is that they are exploiting this approximation property of neural networks. That is what we expect them to do. We take a lot of data. Based on this data, we feed the data to the neural net, and we adjust its parameters so that it approximates this data as, as well as possible. So that later, if similar data is shown, then this neural network will give a correct or similar an answer. So there are two phases, the learning phase and the usage phase. The learning phase is what I've described. So you have all this data and you are changing the parameters of the circuit or of the mathematical algorithm that represents the circuit. You're changing the parameters so that the data is fitted as closely as possible. And then when you use it, then you're doing something different. You have the trained network that has learned already and you're giving it an instance of the data and it's giving you an answer which is very close to the previous things that it has learned. Why? Because it is a very good approximator of continuous and bounded functions. So this is really the functioning of neural networks. Uh, recent years have seen the emergence of so something we call deep learning. In the previous period, uh, people used gradient descent learning, which was based on finding uh, efficient algorithms for determining uh, local minima of the error functions between the input data and the required output. And more recently, this has been superseded by what, what one calls deep learning, where you're using multiple levels, multiple repeated levels of nonlinear optimizations so that you can adjust the parameters of the circuit as well as possible to the data. Deep learning, on the one hand, is something, shall we say, new compared to backpropagation learning before, but on the other hand, it's something that is enabled by the uh, much faster uh, power, much greater power of the computing devices we use today. So we can do a lot of optimization in very short time. Another form of learning is important to understand, and that's called reinforcement learning. A lot of the results concerning games that are publicized as being a big success are based on a technique which is also quite old, which goes back to psychologists and which is called reinforcement learning. Uh, it was redeveloped perhaps 30 years ago by a computer scientist called Sutton and before that there was the work of psychologists describing reinforcement learning that had been observed in human beings and in animals. And reinforcement learning is simply that uh, you do something and then based on your success you modify your parameters, your ways of doing the thing so that you hope to become more successful next time. And you repeat this, so you always reinforce the options that you have taken, which uh, increase your success, and you weaken the options that you have taken that would reduce your success with tasks or with different activities or with, uh, for instance, tracking uh, some object flying in the sky that you're trying to follow, and you can use reinforcement learning to track it, to track it better and better and better by changing your actions to be able to follow it more closely. So, in a way, uh, if you think of a game where you're actioning a sequence of events, uh, here you're trying to change your rules of behavior so that at each step you're doing better 
than before and you're saying, well, th I did this and it wasn't very successful, I did that and it was successful, so I'll do that because that is better than this. And this is, uh, this is the process known as reinforcement learning. Now, reinforcement learning itself can be detailed, can be supported by other methods such as, for instance, uh, what we had talked about, uh, deep learning or gradient learning and so on. So they can be accessories to that. In conclusion, I think on the one hand, we are dealing with a very old subject, well-established, lots of links with neurophysiology now, very connected to brain studies. On the other hand, we're dealing with technologies which have become possible because of the dramatic increase in power in computers. And we know, on the one hand, that these objects are very good approximators for continuous and bounded functions, and that's why we use them. On the other hand, we know that a lot of things we ask them to do are undecidable. That is, even the most powerful computer would not be able to, in a guaranteed way, to give an answer to these questions. And yet we use the, these devices in a certain heuristic manner. In the field of neural networks, there are two, uh, perhaps, most important open questions. One is reproducibility. Can, for instance, you're trying to learn a, a face, and the face is presented not in the usual manner, but perhaps at an angle, or perhaps with special shadows, or perhaps in an unusual position, such changes can strongly influence the outcome. So what are the properties of the data that we're using to train neural networks that will avoid these instabilities in the ability of the neural networks to take correct decisions? So this is a very important problem which arises all the time. Uh, the second important question is uh, what is the actual class of problems that these, other than the obvious ones, which are continuous and bounded functions, outside of this world, and there are so many other problems that we have to address, outside of these bounds, these well understood bounds, what are the class of problems in which uh, neural networks can be used reliably? Uh, this question is way open.